joining us for our second Max Minutes. Again, um, we this is just our second one. We started the first one uh, two weeks ago, um, and Stuart Andreessen kicked that one off. And today we've got Alex Camerdell with Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, so we're excited to hear from Alex. Um, just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors um, and our investors that make all of this possible. So thank you to our, our anchor investors. And again, Max's mission is to advance economic competitiveness in the Atlanta region by strengthening connections, collaborations, and practices among workforce developers and organizations engaged in workforce development. So um, keeping connected is critical, especially in this um, in this time that we're dealing with shelter in place and uh, not able to to see many of our family and friends and those people we really adore working with like all of our max members so um for today's uh, um, agenda we've got again alex camerdell with georgia budget and policy institute um presenting on promoting workforce equity and mobility in state and federal policy responses to covid 19 and then we'll have an update from john helton executive director at atlanta career rise on the regional workforce initiative um Again, we're going to use the same process we did last time. If you have questions, um, I'll be fielding questions for Alex uh, during his presentation and trying to synthesize as best I can um, questions on, on uh, that you put in the chat box, but please use the chat box to submit your questions. And just like we did last week, we will send out a copy of all the slides as well as a link to the webinar if you want to go back and listen to it again. With that, let me uh, welcome Alex Camerdell, um, Senior Policy Analyst with Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And I am honored to work with him on multiple projects. We've been working together on the Regional Workforce Initiative, um, and he's bringing a, a wonderful um, wealth of knowledge and perspective to that work, and this ties directly into that. Um, and so without further ado, Alex, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. And now I'm sharing my screen to get set up here. Let's see. And boom. All right. We should be all good. Cool. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning and uh, happy Good Friday, everybody. Um, as Amy mentioned, my name is Alex and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. I've spoken before to this group in the past, but in case some of you are not familiar with GBPI, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and advocacy organization that's laser focused on fiscal and public policy that expands economic opportunity for all Georgians. A little, a little bit winded there, but you get the point. <laughs> I have the pleasure of managing our economic mobility policy portfolio at GBPI, which includes workforce issues and the social safety net. Um, but other policy areas we focus on include K-12 education, healthcare. Um, let's see. Amy told me that my notes are showing. <laughs> uh, one, one second. Amy, I know you messaged me, but can you still see them? Yeah, I think it's the multi-screen setup. I think it'll be fine, um, but before yeah. it didn't didn't show both. Huh? Oh, I see what's happening. Okay. How about that? Perfect. And we. All right. Cool. Yeah, I, I have to pause. I am a millennial, but I don't get all the millennial tech advances. Sometimes I do mess up <laughs> every now and then. So just uh, apologies for that, but just to sum again who we are, we focus on a broad array of policy issues at GBPI, mostly couched in fiscal uh, policy at the state level, so we pay very close attention to what's happening with our state budget. Um, but uh, the broader issues have to do with healthcare, higher education, uh, K-12 education, and we've even started doing a lot of work around criminal justice reform and immigration. So um, we're growing our, our our bucket of things that we focus on, expanding our reach. Um, but again, our, our focus has been pretty heavily on fiscal and budget policy at the, at the state level. I'm really eager and excited to discuss some of the state and federal policy responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, list, uh, definitely wanna you know, 
add an extra emphasis on how the policy should be responsive to the needs of the workforce community that is attempting to promote equity during this time, which is hypercritical right now. So to set the stage, and I do apologize, it's gonna feel a little uh, doom and gloom, <laughs> but I did wanna set, shed some light on the potential magnitude of this virus and its economic impact on Georgia. Um, I wanted to provide some data that we're monitoring very closely and it's changing um, almost on a weekly basis. Um, but currently estimates, estimates show that the state's economy will shed up to 600,000 jobs just by the summer months with the brunt of those job losses felt by workers employed in low-wage occupations. In Metro Atlanta alone, those low-wage jobs account for 43% of the workforce. Nearly half of the area's workers are at high risk of being displaced from work, and many of them already have been, as, as we're seeing right now. I know in the last um, Max Minutes presentation, my friend Stuart and, and Andresen and Sarah Miller from the Fed already went through the data on who those workers and industries are, so I won't uh, spend any extra time on that. But please bear in mind, the number you see here or any numbers that I discussed today do not represent the peak at all. Um, during the Great Recession, we didn't hit our job loss trial in Georgia until a year and a half after the recession started in 2007. So this is definitely concerning. Um, a lot of people have asked questions about what a pandemic, uh, you know, economic downturn recovery will look like. And, you know, economists describe recoveries in the, in the shape of alphabetic letters. So um, a lot of people are saying we'll have a V-shaped recovery. Some are saying, uh, given the latest numbers, it'll be more U-shaped. Um, this uh, model year projects a slanted L or either a wide V. It really depends on how you, how you decide to, to view it. But the models are changing um, every day, and it's so difficult to predict what kind of recovery we'll have um, because it's all dictated by, by a virus um, right now and how much social distancing we're doing and, and the care that we're taking in our communities. So, however, um, one of the, some, a lot of consensus in terms of what we need to, to stimulate the recovery has to do with the amount of money that it takes to, to go into the economy to get people back to work and get people earning wages and buying products. Um, and there's an agreement that it would take trillions of dollars um, in order to make the contraction of the recession of this recession improve. And we're already seeing that, and as I'll speak to later, with trillions of dollars invested through some of the federal acts um, that passed through Congress and were signed by the president, as well as some additional uh, relief that was authorized by the feds in the form of loans over the last couple of days. So definitely looking at a, at a longer uh, recovery period um, beyond, I think, just the, the current year or the next, uh, definitely reaching into 2021, but it's definitely a long game here. Uh, as most of you know, unemployment insurance is what provides compensation to workers that are recently laid off due to no fault of their own. Um, Georgia is seeing unprecedented demand in UI during the coronavirus. It's really difficult to comprehend the, the magnitude of the crisis because we've never seen anything like this before, or at least not since the, the Great Depression. Um, following federal and state declarations of a public health emergency, thousands face job losses. In just weeks, Georgia's UI claims soared from over 5,000 to 388,000, an increase of 7,000%, as you can see in this chart. And these are the numbers that just came out yesterday. So these numbers make it difficult, again, to, to really get a grasp on, on what we're dealing with here. I, I personally haven't even been able to absorb what um, the shock to our economy right now, in particular, the shock that all of these workers and their families are, are facing. With the increasing uh, economic uncertainty and impact of the pandemic on low-wage jobs, though, the safety net is where people are turning to get help. Unfortunately, though, um, it remains still pretty inadequate to address what we're experiencing right now. Just staying on unemployment insurance, for example, uh, 
out of all of Georgia's unemployed persons in a typical year, just 17% are able to access unemployment compensation. The way we set up UI eligibility rules in Georgia make a crucial difference during recessions and our ability to counter those. So Georgia's UI system was built for the sort of economy in place decades ago and has never been updated for today's workforce. For instance, Georgia workers who claim unemployment insurance because they were laid off from part-time jobs, because we are one of few states that allow part-time workers to access uh, UI, they have to seek full-time employment in order to continue receiving benefit. Under normal circumstances, Georgia also doesn't offer benefits for people who need to leave their jobs to care for a sick family member, although the state does during the current emergency, which I will touch on later. And Georgia also fails to count a worker's most recent work history when determining eligibility, which tends to cut off low-income people employed in low-wage industries with volatile work hours. <clears throat> These rules uh, particularly harm women and people of color who are more likely to fall through these cracks in unemployment insurance. For instance, women are much likelier than men to work in part-time jobs and to leave work to care for a family member. And black workers are much likelier than white workers to experience discrimination in job hiring and treatment on the job, leaving them more often with spotty work histories and therefore uh, less likely to qualify for unemployment insurance. Alex, yes. can I ask a quick question um, yeah. on that previous slide you were just on? Does that, um, does the fact that we have less than 20% typically in Georgia that qualify for our unemployment benefits, does would that impact their ability to get that extra um, $600 uh, from the federal government through the end of July? That's a great question. So it won't impact the, the monies coming to Georgia right now, um, not the $600. As a matter of fact, the DOL is reporting that they've already began to add that uh, allotment to folks' benefits, um, or they're at least expecting to, folks should expect to see that increase or that bump um, next week, or, or if not sooner, if it didn't happen this week. Um, there are some other changes that do need to be made in order for us to draw down administrative funding to expand our unemployment insurance system, um, which I'll talk about in, the, in the, some of the upcoming slides. And let's see. Cool. Uh, all right. Another safety net system for low-wage workers that has been unable to reach its full potential is, is SNAP. Um, it's the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's uh, commonly called food stamps. Um, and like UI, uh, SNAP is the first line of defense during an economic downturn. As you can see here during um, the Great Recession, the 2009 through um, for Georgia, we didn't peak until a few years after this recession started in 2007. Uh, it took a few years for our SNAP participation to really ramp up, but we reached a, a high of 2 million uh, food stamp participants during that downturn. Um, but, you know, in order to receive food assistance, you have to demonstrate that you are working or uh, looking for work generally, unless you are, uh, there are some exemptions, including uh, disability, as well as if you're caring for a young child. However, if you are a childless adult and you receive food assistance, that work requirement does get a lot harder. Um, you have to find a job or participate in training in three months or less if you wanna keep receiving food assistance. These work rules do make it particularly challenging for low-wage workers who often do not have competitive credentials to compete for quality jobs or lack the additional supportive services such as transportation to meet their requirements and get their food assistance. Again, these rules have an outsized impact on workers of color and women. Alex, did they change some of that just for the time being? Yeah, they did. And I'll, um, I'll talk about that with the, the state uh, response. Okay. I was setting up the, where we were currently with our, our safety net to show that over the recovery period from the Great Recession, that we have some, we've fumbled a little bit and have made some decisions, particularly on the funding side, but of course on the administrative rules side of things, 
that make it more difficult to access the safety net. And which is why we're seeing the need to implement all of these stringent, these massive structural emergency changes to the program right now. But I'll discuss some of the specific changes to that program um, in just a moment. Thank you for asking that. The um, continuing, on, continuing on for just context purposes, um, past and current policies um, continue to stifle progress for Metro Atlanta and reinforce economic disadvantage. You know, for example, the overall unemployment rate um, in Metro Atlanta at the end of 2018 for black workers was over 6%. This level of black unemployment is still at a level that would be considered unacceptable in a thriving economy. And this, um, this begs the question, would we celebrate unemployment rates of 6% if it were that high for white workers? We certainly did not during the Great Recession. And so my point here is that economic downturns and even the recovery that follows is incredibly uneven in terms of the racial inequities workers of color face compared to white workers. These workers disproportionately turn to relief, primarily through the safety net programs, such as SNAP and unemployment insurance, and reemployment or training services through the public workforce system to provide stability. The safety net is a vital system to keep workers of color from falling even deeper behind their counterparts in a recession, but it must be intact and bolstered with significant targeted investments. Oops. Um, I, I also just wanted to share with you all a look at who essential workers are. Um, and these are numbers that reflect uh, the, the workers in the state, not just in Metro Atlanta. Um, but we've gotten a lot of questions about who the essential workforce is um, in Georgia. Um, we have partners who have helped to define the essential workers or those frontline uh, workers as those working in industries such as grocery and grocery retail public transit, transit, uh, trucking, warehouse, and postal service, building cleaning services, healthcare, obviously, and lastly, childcare and social services. Um, but this is just, I didn't, uh, I, I just got this information or this uh, table compiled the other day and didn't have enough time to make it any, any fancier than this. Um, but just wanted to demonstrate who's overrepresented in the essential workforce right now. Um, as you can see, or, and it's a, probably really difficult to see, uh, despite making up just 31% of the total workforce, black Georgians make up 41% of the essential or frontline workforce. So these are the workers who, despite are often receiving low hourly pay, um, lack employer-sponsored health coverage and other benefits such as health insurance, um, excuse me, paid leave, are still working through this crisis to make ends meet. Okay, so now that I've uh, set the stage a bit, I, I'm going to quickly um, go through and summarize the number of ways that the state is easing access to the safety net for low-wage workers that are displaced from the workforce during the pandemic. So that I'll answer or begin to answer some of the questions or points that um, Amy lifted up. So I alluded to this earlier, but one area where there is significant change impacting low-income workers and their families is in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, that food stamp program we have in the state. To help low-income workers and families meet their nutritional needs, the state of Georgia increased its benefits to the maximum allowed for all households during the months of March and April. The agency defects, which administers the benefits, has also extended the renewal period for six months for SNAP participants scheduled to renew in March, April, and May. So for those who were approaching their deadline to renew their benefits in order to keep receiving food assistance, they now will receive an additional six months. And lastly, with the help of new federal rule changes, the state is able to suspend all work requirements for SNAP participants, to Amy's question earlier. As, as I mentioned, um, if you're a childless adult receiving SNAP, you have to find a job or participate in a training activity within three months or less. And this is a huge, um, this policy change is a huge help for addressing racial equity issues as people of color, as I mentioned, face those structural challenges in the labor market. The uh, major step just simply recognizes that no one should be 
penalized for being unable to work or look for work during this time. Next, there were a couple of changes I want to note to the CAPS program, which is our state's child care subsidy program uh, for working families. Um, first, the Department of Early Care and Learning suspended work reporting requirements for CAPS families. Like SNAP and other programs, parents are expected to report work hours and earnings in order to receive child care. So this was a huge move. Um, DECAL also established a hotline to connect the essential workforce to child care options ranging from healthcare workforce to grocery store workers. And considering the overrepresentation of workers of color in the essential workforce, this is a big help to mitigate racial inequities and impacting these workers and their caregiving responsibilities. The agency is also working feverishly to protect childcare providers, which are also small businesses disproportionately owned and operated by women and often women of color operating on thin margins that are likely having to close their doors due to the virus. And then uh, lastly on the state front for now, and this isn't all encompassing in the presentation, um, but just wanted to pick, uh, select some highlights. Um, but some big adjustments have obviously been made to Georgia's unemployment insurance system that I wanna highlight before digging into the much larger federal changes. The Department of Labor acted very quickly um, within days of the uh, public health emergency being declared to relax rules and help more people access UI during this time. Georgia's Department of Labor, for example, mandated that <clears throat> employers file unemployment insurance claims on behalf of workers that they anticipate laying off as a result of closures or a large reduction in their workforce, which this helps workers um, actually access assistance more quickly and doesn't require uh, individuals to go and file claims in purpose. I mean, excuse me, yeah, file claims on purpose in person. <clears throat> the agency also uh, suspended the job search requirements for claims that are filed on or after March 14, 2020. Again, recognizing that that work requirement is such a large um, challenge and, and burden for folks during this time. And then uh, the agency also extended eligibility uh, for unemployment insurance to workers with reduced hours or leaving work temporarily due to illness to care for a family member who is ill or does not have childcare as a result of their provider or school being closed during the pandemic. And lastly, um, Georgia, uh, before a few weeks ago, used to have one of the shortest duration of UI benefits in the country, I think. Uh, third, you know, to North Carolina and Florida, maybe, um, who have a floor or had a floor at the time, I don't know if it's changed, of just 12 weeks. We were at 14 weeks uh, maximum, and the reason for that was because Georgia, during the Great Recession, basically depleted its entire UI trust fund and had to find ways um, to save, to build it back up and save money. Um, so we were capped at 14 weeks. Uh, now, uh, just as, as of a couple of weeks ago, the Department of Labor has, has extended the duration of unemployment insurance benefits to 26 weeks. So that's a huge policy change that we hope to make, make permanent um, to extend beyond just the, the emergency period. Um, but I'll talk about how that interacts with some of the federal changes in, in just a moment. I did want to pause um, really quickly. I know I ran through some of that information um, at lightning speed. So if there are any questions just in what I've discussed so far, I'm happy to take them. I don't know, Amy, if we've got any in and I'm looking at our Q&A. Uh, um, so one, I'm not sure. I think you're covering it very well so that we don't have very many questions at the moment. But one question that I had was that 26 weeks that Georgia Department of Labor extended it to, how does that compare to other states in the South? Yeah, absolutely. So at this moment, um, unless the other, and I haven't checked to see if they've made the changes um, as rapidly as Georgia has, but uh, 26 weeks is the maximum allowed under federal law for state systems. So we are certainly leading in that regard, um, but we used to be almost in last place. So I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. I can find out where we compare and according to other states, but I mean, the majority of states in the country 
before we changed our policy, did extend the duration of benefits to 26 weeks and had that law or that policy on the books um, for a number of years before, before we did. Okay, that's perfect, thank you. And I'm seeing a question from Karen, uh, Karen Kramer. I've been hearing uh, that a lot of self-employed people haven't been able to apply because the Department of Labor hasn't been updated. Have you been hearing that? Yes, so we've been hearing that a lot. Um, I'll speak more about why the, the self-employed uh, UI changes are, are taking a while um, to happen, but in, uh, in short, basically the Department of Labor has to build a new system to offer a service that they've not offered before. Uh, self-employed, independent contractors, um, you know, folks who don't pay a payroll tax for the UI system were not eligible for unemployment insurance. So um, the CARES Act, the federal legislation that the, the passed a few weeks ago, created a new program for self-employed individuals. And just quite frankly, a, a lot of folks who are self-employed rushed to file for unemployment insurance um, instantly once they heard that there were changes being made. Um, but unfortunately, the Department of Labor in the beginning stages had to deny most of those claims because we did not have the, the structure, the system in place to, to provide those benefits. So, um, so yes, uh, we're hearing that it's happening. My, uh, as of now, the State Department of Labor has created the form and the application for self-employed individuals to apply. So they are telling those folks to go and apply now. And they're saying that if you did apply um, previously, that they will, that you will not have to reapply for unemployment insurance as a self-employed person. They will use, uh, they will go back retroactively, find your application, update your information for your claim and um, administer those benefits. Now the timeliness and the, on the getting those benefits administered according to Mark, but Commissioner Butler um, may take a few weeks. So they're definitely going to experience a lag, um, but most people are experiencing a, a, a huge delay because um, again, the, the demand is unprecedented. It's, it's getting out of control and the system just can't handle it right now. So cool. All right. Well, I'll, I'll jump into some of the federal changes so far. The uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, is getting a lot less love uh, than the CARES Act right now, but it was uh, one of the earlier packages that were passed by Congress. Um, and what it does, is it, it tends to just address the critical need for, um, for uh, paid leave for employees and provide some additional relief to employers on that front. Uh, the act requires that employers with fewer than 500 employees provide two weeks worth of paid sick leave, and that's about 80 hours. Um, if employees are unable to work because they are subject to quarantine or isolation, or perhaps they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, or they're caring for someone who is in quarantine or isolation and or have children in, um, in schools that have closed. However, um, there is no requirement to provide any such benefits to uh, employers with more than 500 people, and that leaves a huge number of workers without an option. Um, further, more than a million Metro Atlanta workers work in companies with more than 500 employees. So, uh, I, you know, there's no way of knowing how many of those who are left out of the federal provision are still going to um, have access to paid leave options but more than a million are not going to benefit from the change in the federal law specifically. The second provision I'll note from this uh, Families First Act is related to unemployment insurance. Um, the bill provides the administrative funding to help states build their capacity to handle the massive amounts of claims. Um, this is uh, super critical for us. The Labor Commissioner, uh, Mark Butler, he recently said that, you know, DOL is currently working with half the workforce that they had during the Great Recession. Um, and, you know, he's been very honest. He's been, you know, sharing video updates and has been on Twitter tweeting, you know, directly to individuals just being frank. And he's even told the governor himself that, you know, we're experiencing something that we just don't have the, the bandwidth to, to control. Um, and we need extra resources, especially for the administration of, of these benefits. 
Um, he said yesterday that the Department of Labor uh, processed more claims in a week than they did in the entire year of 2019. So this is definitely um, welcomed help from the federal government. Um, but uh, Georgia has to apply for those funds um, that are coming down, down the pipe for the Department of Labor. Um, and the purpose of applying for the funds is for states to demonstrate or, or outline how they plan to make um, accessing unemployment insurance benefits easier. So the, one of the ways that you know, states are exploring improving access to the benefit is through improving its online application system because that's really the best way to connect and, and uh, file claims right now, especially because of the social distancing requirements. So um, I, I'm not sure right now if the state has already submitted its grant application for that. Um, there was a quick turnaround. So I'm sure that it's already um, you know, made its way through, but if, if um, the specifics laid out in that and how it plans to improve its system, I'm not sure um, what is included at this time, but we'll certainly be on the lookout for that and happy to share any updates on that front because I'm definitely interested in see what changes are, are being made. Um, now we're jumping into the CARES Act, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And this is quite frankly, the biggest package. It was the third package uh, passed and signed into law. Uh, this is that $2 trillion um, relief package uh, that has a, a host of, of provisions related to low-wage workers and low-income low people. Um, and the purpose of this package is really to get cash to people and help sustain them through uh, a, a longer um, downturn. So um, here's, here's where the biggest changes are. Um, as many people have, have noted or are aware of, um, this provides what are called recovery rebates, or a lot of people have been referring to them as stimulus checks. Um, the CARES Act provides these direct payments to individuals and families, and these are one-time payments, and they'll be based on uh, prior year's income. So in order to get the payments, individuals have to have filed a 2019 or 2018 tax return in order to automatically get the, the rebate. And they're using those, uh, the incomes reported on those returns in order to determine the amount of your stimulus uh, payment. So I have to emphasize again that you have to file taxes in order to, to get the rebate. And although the state and federal filing deadline has been moved uh, to July 15th, um, please encourage everyone you know, everyone in your networks, your friends, your families, your neighbors, to file as soon as possible in order to prevent delays in receiving payment. Uh, to the specifics of the rebates are in this chart here, um, but the rebate amount is in calculated on a sliding scale and it's depending on your income and the number of dependents you have. And I see a question coming through, let's see. Amy, you want to read that one? Or? Yes. Um, so Jeanette is asking if persons uh, 17 to 23 who were claimed on their parents' um, 2019 taxes or, or 20, I, I guess whatever the last return they filed, uh, yeah. either 2018 or 2019, um, won't receive the rebate. Yes. So Jeanette's asking if that's true. That is um, very unfortunately true. Um, the rebate checks have a lot of limitations in them. That is one of the largest ones. Um, there has been a lot floating around about what the circumstances of like actual college students, for example, are um, who are missing out on these rebate checks. Um, and uh, we're trying to shine a bright, bright spot on that for the next relief package that you know, is being considered in Congress. Um, as those debates are starting. But yeah, that's one of the, the huge limitations. It's, you know, if, for those who are familiar with the earned income tax credit, they, uh, which is a federal tax credit that um, phases out with income, it's very similar in, in, uh, to what we're talking about right now. Um, but they basically took the assumptions for the EITC, which is that young people between the ages of 18 and 24 um, 
are, rely on their parents for income. So they're not eligible for the earned income tax credit, the EITC. That same logic has been applied to these rebate checks. And we know that that is not a, uh, young people are not a monolith. Um, and that caregiving responsibility, or, you know, young people in that age bracket are also parents and have caregiving responsibilities as well. So um, that is definitely something that we're trying to address. And I think that they were working so fast to get the rebate, you know, stimulus checks out the door and get people um, uh, the relief that they need. Obviously, people fall through the cracks and, and there are those unintended consequences. And it says, uh, what happens with people who didn't have to do taxes because their income were so low, but they are U.S. citizens from Monaco? Uh, great question. So if you did not file taxes, um, one of the ways that the IRS is trying to help folks is they're trying to set up a simplified form on their website so individuals can go and um, submit their income uh, information uh, virtually through, through the IRS website, including their direct deposit information, because that's the, the quickest way to get the payments through. Um, now that is a, you know, an anticipated, you know, change that they're looking to make, which is why we're still encouraging folks to just file their taxes, um, uh, tax returns. So the, um, the, so yeah, so I wouldn't wait, I, me personally, I would not wait for the IRS to set up that simplified form, um, basically. Let's see, so if the 17, from Jeanette, if the 17 and 23 year old file taxes because of income, but their parents claim them as a dependent, that is the same situation. They will not receive the rebate. That is correct. That is the same applies there. If your parents claimed um, you as a dependent, unfortunately, they are not going to issue the rebates to that group. And I, again, I, it is a glaring, um, uh, misstep uh, there that I'm hoping that we can address. Um, I'm a, I'm a, we'll share, again, these slides will be available so you can see the, the breakdown and specifics of the, of the rebates. Um, oh, Jeanette, <laughs> my 19 years, year old is upset, but we'll be okay. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I know a lot of young people who are uh, definitely upset um, right now, especially those uh, better students. The, is the rebate calculated on gross income or taxable income? It's your adjust, adjusted gross income, your AGI, yeah. All right, let me move on because I've got a good few more to cover. Um, so the biggest changes, oh wait, Amy? I'll, I'll field your questions for you so you can. Okay. Cool. Just in between each slide, I'll let you know. All right. So the, some of the biggest changes um, were in the CARES Act had to do with unemployment insurance. And what we, what we got from uh, the CARES Act for UI were three new programs established. And I do apologize, they all are, are sound the same. Um, so it's a little confusing to describe, <laughs> you know, uh, each of the three programs, but here, here they go and, and bear with me. So. Uh, the first program established is called Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, and this provides help for workers that don't qualify for usual state unemployment insurance. So to Karen's question earlier, this is the program that pays the benefits for self-employed workers, those gig workers, and the duration of the uh, benefits for, the, for these workers using the PUA is 39 weeks through the through December 31st, 2020. The pandemic unemployment compensation uh, is the next program. Um, and just follow along through the chart here. Uh, and this lasts through July 31st, 2020. And this is where those $600 uh, payments are, are coming from that Amy asked about earlier. Um, so UI claimants uh, will get their normal state unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, which in Georgia average about $300 per week, but they will get an additional bump in $600 all the way through uh, July 31st. So it's just a temporary bump. It's not a permanent, it's, it's not extended currently, um, but that's going to be a huge help. 
And then lastly, the program uh, called Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation extends the duration of regular state unemployment insurance by an additional 13 weeks. So thanks to Georgia recently expanding the duration of benefits um, from 14 weeks to 26 weeks, workers are eligible for a total of 39 weeks in Georgia uh, with the PEUC, which is that last program. So let me move on because I want to do these. Just uh, some other provisions I want to hit on. Um, there is some additional money for uh, workforce included, but it's unbelievably insufficient for I think the, the challenge, challenges ahead. Um, there's about 345 million in the Dislocated Worker National Reserve Fund, and these are grants to help uh, states um, get dislocated workers back into work through reemployment and retraining services. Um, the currently um, passed through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, or WIOA. Um, but again, these are, this is not enough money um, to help get us through the crisis, for sure. Um, Alex, can yeah. you um, give some context uh, as to the way I understand it, like what type of, um, how much stimulus was put into the economy back in 2000, between like 2008, 2009, because of the financial crisis relative to what we're seeing now? And is it just that this has just happened or? Yeah, I think um, this is, this. so we're, the amount that we're seeing now is definitely not going to be the, the final stop. Um, we're going to see increases and increases over the next couple of years. You know, during the Great Recession, the Congress had to come back repeatedly and reauthorize and pass um, relief um, on multiple fronts. I think unemployment insurance uh, was extended or and the investments in it were, were increased um, about five or six times throughout that period. Um, the biggest uh, relief investment that we're all familiar with was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARRA, um, in 2009. That stimulus package, um, you know, just in the, in, in the realm of workforce um, alone, pumped about $1.3 billion into uh, workforce development. And uh, across the country, not just in, in, in Georgia. Um, and we're actually, there was about $4 billion in workforce funding through that. So compare that three, four, 345 million just for this one program, the Dislocated Worker Reserves, to the 4 billion that was administered during the Great Recession to workforce. Um, you know, there's obviously a big, <laughs> massive gap there. So we are not, I think this is just the beginning. Uh, we'll likely see Congress come back again and again to pass packages that incre increase the amount of money for relief um, until they get it right. But um, right now, I think they're just working at rapid pace to, to get dollars out the door and make all kinds of political compromises too, which are difficult to make right now, um, given that they can't really even meet in person to pass legislation um, in appropriations. So we've got a few more questions along the lines of your previous slide about um, the the checks coming from mm -hmm. the one-time checks. Um, and so I think there's a couple different questions. One is um, people are asking how they can sign up for those things. And I think it's just based off of your tax return, they'll send it to you. Is that correct? You don't yeah. have to physically sign up for anything? There's nothing you have to, if you file, if you filed your taxes in 2018 or 2019, there's nothing you have to do. Um, well, let me not say that. Make sure that your direct deposit information on your returns is, is current. I had to go and check and make sure, you know, my direct deposit information on my return is the current bank that I'm using now. So if you have filed, you generally don't have to do anything. Just make sure that the IRS has the most recent banking information for you so that they know where to deposit the, the funds. Um, however, if you have not filed, then there is um, pre presumptively going to be uh, a somewhere for you to sign up to receive the, the stimulus money. And that is going to be through the IRS website where they are telling people that they are setting up a simplified form uh, filing form 
for folks to submit their information and receive, receive the payments. So for the extended um, unemployment periods, if you were laid off before, what was it, March 14th, mm -hmm. are you eligible for those extended time periods? Do you yeah. your job market? Yeah, so the way that the UI works is you have to have the, what's considered recently employed and recent earnings. Um, they look at four different, like two quarters in a, in a four quarter period, which is a full year. So um, it, you know, if you're long term unemployed, you know, for more than a year, then obviously it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to be eligible for unemployment insurance, even for the new federal programs, because most of that, those eligibility stipulations still apply. Um, they adopt the, they apply the state rules or regs to, to that on that front. Um, but if you, you know, if it was in the last, you know, I mean, you would have been, you would have been eligible for unemployment insurance in that before the 14th under under regular circumstances so um i hope that makes sense yes yeah. so for um the gig workers and independent contractors do they how do they apply do they apply just like everybody else would apply for unemployment yes yeah, so you would apply on the department of labor the georgia department of labor's website um, go to the online application and they have added uh, fields to collect information from self-employed or gig workers um, to help process them. So that is, you would apply just as you would with regular, uh, for regular, as regular workers. Um, okay. Well, and I, everybody's a regular worker, but you know. <laughs> As I understand it, the, the stimulus checks um, are not considered taxable income. They're not going to tax that for our next correct. year. And are they going to do unemployment that same way or will those? That's correct. The unemployment insurance for the, it does not tax income. Okay. Right. And it doesn't count against your, it, there is no income. Um, it doesn't count as income that will count against a person's ability to access other benefits. So one of the questions that's come up is, does this income count against me if I go and apply for SNAP, for food assistance, or for um, for TANF and, and other uh, programs? And this will not. And the my understanding at this time is that the rebate checks, those payments will not count against um, folks looking for a safety net support as well. Cool. So um, I'm going to, is that all the questions so far? Yeah, I think we've, I think we've gotten them all. Okay. You've got about five minutes. Yeah, let me jump into, um, really quickly, I did want to make note of uh, that there is relief in this for small businesses, um, but what's really unique about the relief for small businesses is that it also includes nonprofits. Um, so nonprofit organizations for this particular community who are providing workforce services and who are providing uh, safety net support services um, are going to be eligible for payroll protection um, uh, uh, programs, insurance premium loans for uh, insurance premiums um, to provide and cover the cost of rents and et cetera. So um, this has been a really helpful move for, for folks who are delivering these services and need, uh, and are, again, working on very thin margins in the nonprofit community. Um, however, what we're finding now is that the banks and others are, are telling folks that this is still not enough, the demand is extreme. So any additional debates or discussion on future relief is going to have to include a boost in relief, um, primarily through the payroll protection program uh, for these small businesses so they can retain their employees and, and keep folks um, in their workforce. And then uh, I want to jump into some of the revenue uh, challenges um, that we're having. The largest challenges uh, facing all of the services that I've talked about today are going to be revenue related, um, not just for the state uh, and not just for local public, you know, government run services, but also for the nonprofit providers who receive contracts from these agencies to deliver services. Um, the virus is, you know, causing our, our uh, revenues to take a huge hit in Georgia um, and in the local uh, governments as well. So um, a lot of, I mean, nearly half of our state revenue is generated off of income taxes. 
Um, and just in the last four weeks, we lost, you know, about 10 percent of our income tax revenue generating power with half a million workers across the state having to leave, leave their jobs. So it's not just uh, state revenues that are taking a hit. Again, like I said, the local and county and city governments are, are also taking a huge hit with the closing of local businesses, freezes in tourism and the hotel motel tax collections, et cetera. So um, just want to emphasize here that this is how we fund all of the services we're talking about today. So the CARES Act uh, provides a su substantial relief to states and to uh, local governments to help beef up those revenues, which are, which are taking that big hit. Um, the bulk of the funding in Georgia uh, is going to be allocated using a population-based formula. Um, Metro Atlanta's local governments uh, with a population in, of excess of 500,000 people are eligible to receive uh, a, almost half of the share of the state's uh, allocation. Um, we're confident, I think, right now that a lot, a lot of those monies will land at the county level. Um, considering that cities like Atlanta are just shy of the 500,000 uh, population mark. Um, but there may be, you know, there may be some flexibilities around that. We're not sure at this time. Um, but we definitely think that our regional coordinated approach to revenue relief um, will be very helpful. Um, so with just a few last minutes, uh, I want to talk about some call to action. Um, you know, with, with, with not a few, sorry, <laughs> with my last minute or maybe minute and a half, uh, with all these rapidly evolving policy changes, where does that leave us? And how can we ensure our people in the region, especially our workers of color, are not left behind um, again in this recovery? Um, so at the start of this, uh, of this year, as many of you know, a group came together representing a variety of organizations and launched the Regional Workforce Initiative for Metro Atlanta, or RWI. Um, and I imagine a number of you may have attended the kickoff event. Uh, the initiative launched right before the world took a huge pause. But in that kickoff, um, one of the number one issues that bubbled up from all of the workforce providers, advocates and funders, and even some of the government leaders in the room uh, was the issue of racial equity and economic mobility. So um, as you can see in this uh, slide, you know, Metro Atlanta was rife with challenges, equity issues before the COVID-19 struck. And, um, like I said at the start of this, I don't have to run through all these data points. We are all, all know them too well. But myself, um, Amy, and, and John, who's on the call, who will explain this work um, in, in more depth, um, we're trying to strategize with a larger group um, to think about a path forward that prioritizes racial equity. Um, because we, one thing remained clear is that we don't want to go back to where we were before this whenever recovery starts, um, especially as it relates to how our workers of color were faring um, in our region. So I do, um, before I pass it over to John, I did want to say that, you know, one of the low hanging fruit opportunities before us is that, you know, according to the CARES Act and what I mentioned about the revenue shortfalls and um, all of the money that's coming into the, to the region over the next few months, there's a big opportunity to guide those investments and make sure that they land where they need to land and in a way that promotes racial equity and, and mobility. Um, so I worked with Amy um, and other members of the uh, RWI Racial Equity Work Group to develop some guidelines or some principles to um, help steer um, some of the discussions and policy decisions that are gonna be made uh, over the next, uh, over the short term. So. Um, happy to, to run through these uh, more offline, um, but also if you are interested in this in this effort, and again, John will speak to this more more broadly. Um, but in, as it specifically relates to racial equity in our region during this during this COVID nineteen moment, and in, in helping to develop some of the strategies, um, racial equity strategies for this moment please feel free to reach out to me um, and, and join us in, in this effort. Um, I have here that we have our first call scheduled for April 23rd at 10 a.m. Um, with, you know, there's a broad group of stakeholders involved. Um, and so if you would like to be one of them, just shoot me an email, let me know. And um, I would be happy to, you know, have more folks on board. But with that, I will pass it on to John. Um, I raced to that last part, but John will give more information about RWI 
and how we can be proactive in this moment. Alex, can you give me the screen back, please? Yeah. So, and thank you so much. This has been um, very helpful. Lots of great questions from people. I know there's, it's, it's, what are these, one act was like 800 pages or something. So it's, it is really um, challenging to cover all the nooks and crannies of these, of these various acts. So thank you for um, bringing that to us and sharing that with us. We really appreciate all of your, um, your wealth of knowledge here. So appreciate it. Of course. And now, um, John Helton with Atlanta Career Rise, as Alex mentioned, um, will give us an update on the Regional Workforce Initiative. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so Alex, thank you again. Amy, thank you for um, the opportunity to talk about RWI. We're all in this together, definitely, from the beginning of the planning for the RWI. But, um, Alex, let me just say again, um, you're brilliant, and thank you. For, we're so <laughs> grateful for having um, you and the Budget and Policy Institute as a resource to bring this information to us, because otherwise, I think we would all be scattered um, trying to figure this out for ourselves. And that's really what re the Regional Workforce Initiative is about. It's about achieving a level of coordination among us so that we all are doing the things that we're strongest at and that we're doing it in a coordinated fashion um, and that we have a plan for doing so. And you know, what better example than the COVID-19 crisis to illustrate the point um, and the value of having a regional workforce plan. Um, this, as you all know, and I'm looking down the list of participants right now, many of you have heard this spiel um, to a time or two before, so I'll, I'll um, spare you again the bulk of it, but uh, I know that many of you were at the, uh, the March 4th kickoff at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights um, when we launched uh, what we thought was going to be a very structured plan for stakeholder engagement around the Regional Workforce Initiative. And then, of course, our current circumstances began happening. Um, so we pivoted. So very briefly, I, and Alex kind of alluded to this, I wanted to give everybody um, some reassurances that, that the work continues um, and that we have put together an alternate plan on stakeholder engagement. Over the next few months, we plan on continuing to do what we wanted to do, uh, but in a modified fashion. So um, as, as we expressed at the March 4th kickoff, we were planning on breaking up into different stakeholder and issue groups um, to work on specific uh, items and, and things that you all identified that you had interest in. We had about 120 people attend that particular event. We got the feedback from you as to what you wanted to do. Um, we have, have, have modified that and we've created a, about a 17 member focus group to kind of begin some fundamental work on values and guiding principles for the work that we'll be doing over the next few months. And then also to give some structure to those issues and stakeholder groups so that when we can come back together, we have a framework and an infrastructure put into place so that we can begin the work full force. So please, if you have comments, if you want to be involved, um, as Alex said, he's got, he's leading this effort around equity, which is so important for us. Um, you know, something that's come high on my mind um, as, as these reports, particularly in the last week, have arisen about the disproportionate number of African-American folks who are affected from a health perspective by the COVID-19 crisis. When you look at both the rates of contraction of COVID-19 and coronavirus, as well as the, the negative outcome to the death rates that are disproportionate to others. Um, and then you factor in what, how employment is a, a social determinant of health in terms of access to health insurance, um, quality of life, and being able to have resources to take care of one's health. It all comes together and it all makes sense. And this is why we're doing this work together and need to coordinate that. And to that end, I wanted to give a big plug for um, an event that Max is having, the Max Leadership Network on Monday. Many of you and most of you know Nathaniel Smith with the Partnership for Southern Equity, 1130 on Monday. If you receive the email to sign up for this particular webinar, then you receive the link to sign up for Monday's um, Max Leadership Network. Nathaniel is going to be speaking to equity and workforce and particularly um, uh, we're going to be asking him to talk about um, health related issues with employment and the ability of folks to have uh, equity in, in workforce and in career development and career advancement. 
Um, so with that, Amy, I'll turn it back to you. And uh, if you have any questions about RWI, please reach out to us. Please stay tuned to it. If the work is continuing, um, like everything else that we're doing right now, we've had to change our plans, but the work is still happening. We want you to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Um, and yes, our next um, Max Leadership Network is Monday. If you, It is going to be a virtual um, event, obviously. Um, given what we're under right now. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that, please email, um, send us something through the Max email or email Joy and she'll get you the Zoom information for that. Um, and then our next Max Minutes will be Friday, April 24th from 9 to 10. And we're um, working on confirming the speaker right now. So hopefully we'll have something for you um, early next week. And with that, stay well. And thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it and have a wonderful weekend.